Welcome back to another video this is a part 4 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 13. Sona's Chance. A high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 13. Even Stranger Bedfellows. Scene, Sona's apartment, bedroom. We start the story with Issei and Sona, once again, sleeping back to back on the top bunk. Instead of being asleep, both teens were wide awake. Sona had a deep scowl plastered to her glasses free face. She also appeared to be grinding her teeth. Issei was just looking off and through the small window blankly. Unlike Sona, Issei actually looked to have a small and dreamy smile while he continued to gaze. Meanwhile, on the bottom bunk, Tsubaki lay under her covers with the sheets over her head. It turned out that she wasn't sleeping either. No, she wanted to stay awake, just in case another surprise happened like the night before. Flashback 20 minutes ago, scene, Sona's bathroom. As an irate Sona marched her way toward the bathtub, Issei's original desires were now cancelled out by absolute terror. Meanwhile, Seraphal, not helping the situation by any means, proceeds to simply wave, wink and smile at her pissed off sister while vanishing in a teleportation circle. Issei's head now flies back and into the bathtub end. Clunk. Sona was about to blast the bathtub with an ice spell, that was until she noticed Issei's face, which was now submerged in the water as bubbles began to float to the surface. Hyodo, don't you try to fool me. Sit up and face your punishment. After another 10 seconds, Sona's angry demeanor changed into a genuinely concerned one. Hyodo, Hyodo. Tsubaki then ran into the bathroom as both of the girls pulled an unconscious and very naked Issei from out of the water. Coughing, Issei opens his eyes and looks at the two concerned girls. He then looks down and reaches for his privates to cover them in a panic. After a few minutes, we find Tsubaki, Sona and Issei, standing in the bedroom. Once again, we see our main protagonist, wearing a purple-colored nightgown this time. Sona the points toward the top bunk. This makes an already nervous Issei jump. Speaking in a very direct tone, Sona makes her order known. You, get up there. You know the drill. Obviously you've proven to me that you cannot be trusted to even bathe alone. Sona thinks for a moment and then blushes, however she shakes the thought off while continuing her declaration. And Seraphal, Sona gains a tick mark. Knowing her, she could be at any place at any time, that means I have to be even more vigilant. Seeing that Issei has yet to move from his position as he simply stares toward the bed, Sona grinds her teeth. Spanked, jumping into the air, Issei felt a sudden sting to his ass. This was motivation enough to climb that three-step ladder and get into bed immediately. Seeing Issei's reaction, Sona's grumpy attitude turned into what could only be described as a slight grin accompanied with a deep blushes across her cheeks. Why did I enjoy that? Sona thought to herself. Tsubaki simply looked indifferent to the situation that played out and casually got into her bottom bunk. Flashback over, scene, bedroom. After a bit of time went by, Sona noticed a change in Issei's breathing. It was time, this is what Sona was waiting for. She then silently popped her head down to look toward the second bunk. Hearing the sudden creaking of the bed, Tsubaki, who was clearly awake, proceeded to faint a snoring sound. Convinced, Sona then moves back and has her attention on the sleeping Issei. Taking a deep breath, the sea tree heiress now begins to unbutton the top of her nightgown. She does this while showing off a very unusual and predatory grin. As Sona now had both of her breasts exposed, she proceeded to carefully roll the sleeping teen as she did the night prior. Once he was facing her, Sona laid back, on her side and simply looked at his face. He looked at peace tonight, that was good. Deciding that she was now getting sleepy, the sea tree heiress proceeded to move up just a bit as her arms went around Issei's neck and shoulders. Now holding the sleeping, Baka, to her chest, Sona instantly felt completely at peace herself. Smiling warmly, the petite devil began to doze off. Pissed. Hey Satan. Jumping all of the sudden, Sona can now see Seraphal's head as it slowly creeps up to eye level. Because of Sona's sudden movement, Issei made a jerking sound which made the girl freeze and look down. Luckily, Issei was still asleep. Turning her direction back at Seraphal, Sona's smile turned into a scowl. Whispering in an angry tone while holding Issei deeper into her chest, 
Sona began her chewing out session. What in all of the nine levels of hell, were you doing with Hyodo? I thought you had underworld business to attend to. Regardless, you, you did the unthinkable. Sona then hissed in a deeper and breathier whisper. You, you kissed him. You kissed him first. Unacceptable. Sarah Fall nods while using a finger against her own lips to indicate Sona should keep it down. Issei then stirred once more. Both girls didn't move. Then, the teen went back to whatever dream he was having as his breathing became steady once again. Sarah Fall then whispers a reply. She does this while holding in a smirk. Well, as I can see, you clearly have the upper advantage right now. What's one kiss compared to boob spoilage? What's this add up to? Two nights in a row now. Satan, look at you, so bold. Sona begins to grind her teeth once again. Shut up, I'm still mad at you. Seraphal makes a fake, yet silent crying gesture. Oh and I thought you would be grateful that I pushed you along to get where you're at. Also, I may or may not have put in a good word for you as Issei had doubts regarding your sincerity. Pulling Issei even tighter into her, Sona now changes her attitude as a small yet curious smile begins to creep along the little devil's face. Really, you put in a good word for me? Why, tell me, tell me now, Seraphal. Seraphal winks, that's not my name, to you that is. Gotta say the magic words first. Rolling her eyes, Sona relents. Oni-chan, please tell me what Issei said and more so, what you told him. Lightly clapping her hands, Seraphal replies in a happy whisper. Issei thinks that Ria Tan only wants him because of his sacred gear. Sona's smile now turns into a serious frown. What? Seraphal continues. Hyodo thought that Rias's alleged selfishness was a trait shared by all high-class devils. Therefore, he had his suspicions about me and about you. Sona nodded as the gears in her head began to turn. That's rather well thought out for someone like Baka, Erm, Hyodo. But, that's not true, is it, I mean, Rias wanting to marry him, only for his gear. Seraphal shrugs her shoulders, it really doesn't matter if she does or doesn't, what matters is that Issei believes it. And because he believes it, he felt you might have the same motives. Well, I suppose he assumed that from both of us. Sona looked back down at the resting team. I never would have thought he felt that way. Seraphal continues. He went on about all of this stuff like knowing how it feels to be a weapon and not a person. Poor boy, thinking that way all the time, must be hard. I couldn't let him go on like that. So, there was only one thing to do. Your magical chan of a big sis reinforced our motives to young Issei here. I told him that we love him for being good old Issei and nothing more. Sona now looked shocked as her attention went back to her sister. You told him I love him, I see. And, how did he take it? Seraphal, who wanted to leave out certain details, mainly the ones where Issei won the Mao's heart with his very sweet words, simply smiled once again. He took the news rather well if you ask me. I mean, you saw his reaction to it all, when you crashed through the bathroom door. And let me tell you something, he's a great kisser. You should try it sometime. Sona's face now had a scowl return to it. Don't tell me things like that, pfft. Also, I know somehow you initiated the kiss, not Hyodo. It's totally something you'd do. Ignoring her sister, Seraphal proceeded to climb into the bed. Sona started to shake her head rapidly, only for her sister to shush her again with her finger to her mouth. Shish, it's fine, you get to have Issei's front and I get his back. Besides, you owe me for reassuring him about your intentions. Putting a fist in her mouth, Sona relents. We now see a sleeping Hyuduo with two C3 devils on either side of him. Seraphal then looks over Issei's shoulder, well, at least we don't have to worry about you suffocating him. Sona looks down at her small chest as Issei is cuddled in between her modest cleavage. She then looks back at a grinning Seraphal. Then, Sona's eyes lowered and focused on her sister's very generous cleavage, as the devil Mao was now wearing a blue milky spiral brand sleeping gown along with a matching sleeping hat, the blouse itself was very revealing. Sona then curses genetics as she takes a deep breath and closes her eyes. Unknown to both C3 devils, Tsubaki had both of her hands over her mouth as she wanted to scream out loud from all of the melodrama she had just witnessed. It was well worth staying awake for this, at least that's what Tsubaki believed. Scene, Sona's bedroom, 
Very early the next morning, beep 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 beep, the sounds of an alarm clock overtook the entire small apartment with an irritating noise. As Issei opens his eyes, he instantly freezes and doesn't move an inch. The teen found himself facing a very impressive flesh crevice, for this was the cleavage of a pair of breasts that Issei was unfamiliar with. These were definitely not Rias's, nor were they Asia's, the size was somewhere in between the two, decided Issei. Also feeling something attached to his back, the teen tried the best he could to remember the night prior. Shit, I am sleeping in President Sona's bed again. That's right, wait then, what is this? Has Sona grown in the middle of the night? That's impossible, even for a devil, or, is it? Deciding to push his face out from these beautiful sets of glorious opai, only to find out who they happened to belong to, Issei found it hard to move with whatever was behind him. Moving his right arm, which seemed to be pinned to his side by what felt like a soft leg, Issei was finally able to pull out of the flesh bags that were blocking his sight. Now seeing two and very familiar blue eyes staring back at him, Issei pushed back even further from, Seraphal. This had a reaction that created a bit of tension as the person who was behind Issei, happened to be none other than Sona. Now, both Sona and Issei are falling off of the top bunk and onto the hard floor. Ouch, damn it, not again. Issei was now rubbing the back of his head once again. Issei then felt a sharp pain toward his stomach. Heaving from what felt like a punch to his gut, Issei turned only to see a very cross Sona, who was also sitting on the hard floor. She also looked to be rubbing a spot on her head as her free hand was balled up into a fist. Issei then noticed that Sona's breasts were completely exposed. The flustered teen knew by making it known that he can see Sona's beautiful and ample breasts, it could and most definitely would make the situation much worse. Issei proceeds to turn his attention onto Sona's face for the time being. Then, Seraphal pops her head over the bed and looks down at the two. After rubbing the sleep from her eyes, the Mao begins to speak in a sleepy voice. Good morning, Satan and Issei-kun. Yan, well, time's a wastin', we really should all get ready. Both Issei and Sona turn their heads toward Seraphal. Issei instantly turned his gaze toward the floor as the Mao's breasts were also very exposed. Sona did a double take on her sister and then looked down at her chest. Then, she instantly covered up as she glanced over toward Issei wanting a reason to take some further frustration out on him. To her surprise, Issei was looking at the ground as he was rubbing his own eyes. This was strange, very strange. Why wasn't his nose bleeding at the very least? This was indeed suspicious. Unknown to all in the bedroom, Issei was thinking about things that didn't involve sex. Things that didn't involve Opai. This was so very hard for him. He searched and searched the back of his mind anything to help him overcome his overwhelming urge. Then, the drag came to the teen's rescue. Partner, you can do it. I am proud that you are trying to hold back your perversion, this is a monumental step. Mowing the lawn, doing boring reports, Matsuda and Motohama, both wearing beach bikinis. Concentrate, partner. As Seraphal was getting down from the top bunk, she looked puzzlingly toward the floored team. Sona was also looking at him with a great deal of perplexion. Issei then places both hands over his own eyes and begins to shake his head back and forth from right to left in a rapid motion. Dear Satan, number, please, for the love of all things unholy, put some fucking clothes on. As both girls looked at the freaked out looking Issei, Tsubaki's covers all of the sudden rise. This makes both Sona and Seraphal jump as a deep moaning sound could be heard. Then, the covers move slightly as a very sleepy and groggy voice could be heard. Keep it down, I was up all freaking night, listening to you play with Hyodo. Now, stop it already. I just need five minutes of quiet. Then, the blankets collapsed as Tsubaki looked to have rolled over on her bed. Sona and Seraphal look at each other, both with facial features that suggest slight fear. Issei also stopped freaking out and now was motionless as his eyes were staring toward the lump under Tsubaki's covers. Seraphal then shrugs her shoulders as she walks toward the still-floored Issei and begins to pat his head. Then, in a whisper, the Mao speaks while she smiles warmly at the nervous eyes of the teen. So, trying to clear your mind of naughty thoughts, were you? Wow, Issei, that's very gentlemanly. I am sure Sona appreciates that, don't you sis? Sona looks over toward Issei, 
as she is also still on the floor. She then blushes while proceeding to punch the teen, once again in his stomach. Baka, Chapter 14, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 14, The Kyoto Express. Scene, Sona's apartment, bedroom. After a few more minutes of whispering, Issei chose to stand from the floor. Even though his stomach felt a bit tender, he thought to himself while looking back into Sona's angry purple eyes. Well, Milky did say I was being all gentleman-like, so, I'm gonna do it. Issei then turned his worried frown into a soft smile. Before Sona could react, Issei then offered his hand. Sona, still sitting on the ground now changed her disposition from her earlier grumpy one, to a softer kinder, yet still suspicious type of disposition. Now squinting around the room, as her glasses were still on the top bunk nightstand, Sona could spot Seraphal only feet from them. She was giving her little sister a thumbs up while smiling and winking. Now looking back at the still waiting, Issei, who still had his hand offered along with that smile, Sona put on her usual stoic mask as she accepted the help to rise from the floor. Though she looked indifferent on the outside, the Citri heiress was actually screaming with intensity and slight embarrassment deep within her subconscious. Issei couldn't help but notice some similar traits that Sona shared with some of his favorite manga rom-coms. It was a specific type of character, but at the moment, the teen just couldn't put his finger on it. Then, he noticed, all of the sudden, Sona was eyeballing him up and down. She did this while beginning to show a slight smirk. Then, being hit by yet another strike of lightning, Issei realized how breezy it was near his legs. Shit, I'm wearing one of Subaki's dress things, again. Why won't they just let me pick up some of my own clothes for a change? This is getting ridiculous. Oh shit, Milky can also see me in this thing. Fuck, my idol will now think of me as a cross-dressing weirdo. Turning around and doing double takes on both Sona and then Seraphal, Issei was about to freak out. That was until, static. T-C-C-C-C-H-H, hello, boss. T-C-C-H-H, we're here with you know whose clothes. T-C-C-H-H. As Sona's entrance intercom was going off, Issei could clearly hear this was Saji's voice. Oh, fuck no, I won't hear the end of this if he catches me wearing this. Instantly, Issei darts past Sona and runs into the bathroom while slamming the door shut behind him. Seraphal began to chuckle as Sona had her jaw agape. The intercom goes off once again. Stop saying TCCHH, Saji, it's immature. Subaki's covers begin to stir. Then, the sheets fly off as we see a very tall and grumpy looking woman with dark circles under her eyes. I'm awake, fine, I'll get breakfast started in a moment. As the queen screamed each sentence, both Sona and Seraphal cringed more and more. Then, the irate Tsubaki stormed toward the bathroom door, only to find it locked. Kyoto, I need to pee. Scene, Kuo Academy, old school building entrance. Rias came from outside of the orc wearing an olive green jumpsuit. She looked to be a bit worse for wear as her attitude suggested depression and mild anguish. With a frown plastered to her sad face, the Switch Princess jumped at the feeling of a cold hand on her shoulder. Turning around, none other than Graphia, wearing her usual maid outfit, stood while staring blankly back at Rias. I hope you got a good night's sleep. Rias, today is going to be the beginning of Hell Week for you. Twelve hour days of pure penance await you my dear. Graphia said this with no emotion whatsoever. Rias, on the other hand, well, she looked absolutely terrified. Rias's fear began to grow even further the moment she spotted the slightest grin on her brother's wife. Scene, Sona's apartment. As Saji, Momo and Ruruko arrived, they brought with them an assortment of different clothing that should fit Issei. Afterwards, Issei left the bathroom wearing a pair of jeans and a blue t-shirt. After Tsubaki got her bathroom time, she proceeded to make a quick breakfast before everyone left for the train station. Scene, Ku train station, 7 a.m. Sona's entire peerage, including her sister and Issei, all entered a large train car. It was a private room that was barely large enough for 10 people. After squishing themselves into the booth-like seats, all went quiet. The seating arrangement had no rhyme or reason to it, aside from Seraphal insisting she sit next to Issei. This prompted Sona to request the same thing. In the end, Issei was stuffed between the two near the window. 
After the train began to start moving, Sona had a thought. If I don't make my move first, Seraphal will surely make hers. That woman is relentless. I need to be aggressive about my approach but I also need to be calculating. Obviously, my peerage know something's up for sure, that can't be helped. But I don't have a choice, I must make a preemptive strike and go in for the kill. Hyodo, prepare yourself. Issei felt himself being pushed into Seraphal as Sona proceeded to stand up from her side of the seat. This made Seraphal smile as she put an arm around the confused team. Oh, my fan wants to cuddle. Okay. However, and to Seraphal's great disappointment, Issei was now being pulled out of his own seat. Sona had one of her hands in one of Issei's while gripping tightly. With everyone's attention on him, Issei was being pulled out of the train car by Sona, who did not look behind her, but instead just looked straight ahead. As the door shuts to the train car, Seraphal tilts her head. My Satan is making her move. Well then, two can play that game. The Mao now has a grin plastered to her face. She also seems to be releasing a bit of demonic energy which makes the rest of the peerage members very nervous. Scene Passage Hallway Down the Train Cars Issei was being pulled very insistently by Sona, who was walking at a fast pace. Issei couldn't help but wonder what he did wrong as the president of the student council seemed very cross at the moment. Though she was holding his hand, aside from that, the teen had reminiscing thoughts regarding his past interactions with Sona, mainly the disciplinary ones that involved his other two classmates. Drawn from his thoughts the moment Sona slammed open a sliding door, the teen then found himself being pulled into the vacant train car. Once there, Sona freed her hand while slamming the door shut behind her. Now heaving in and out, a flustered-looking Sona pointed at the seats. Hyodo, sit down. Without wasting a single moment, Issei did what he was told. Once this happened, Sona sat down opposite and facing the nervous team. Instantly Sona's features softened into something akin to embarrassment. After a deep breath from the heiress, the then adjusted her glasses and slowly showed the slightest of smiles. Hyodo, Erm, um, Issei. I need to tell you something. Sona then waits for a response. Nervously, Issei nods. Returning the nod, Sona continues. I am sure you have gathered by now that I may have, well, feelings for you. Issei nodded but that was only on impulse as he was quite shocked to have heard what Seraphal implied, coming from Sona's own lips. Seeing this, Sona takes another breath and continues on where she left off. So, I've decided that you are my, my, my boyfriend. Issei's jaw now goes agape. Sona then blushes deeply and starts to shake her head rapidly. And don't get any ideas, Hyodo. It's not because I love you or anything like that. Issei didn't know what to say after hearing that last part of Sona's confession, that was until Dredge spoke up in the back of the teen's inner mind. Partner, before you make your next move, listen to my words. Now, I hate to say it, but sometimes I found myself paying attention to some of your questionable reading material. Interestingly enough, this Sona Citri, as complicated as she seems to be I think you and I can break it all down to one simple fact. Can't we? Issei thought hard about Dredge's words, then, like lightning, it came to him. That's right, partner, Sona Citri is your classic Tsunere. Two things happened the moment Issei achieved great clarity. The first was obvious, Sona Citri is in love with him. But the second came at a snail's pace. Was it true? This whole time, was Issei actually into Sona? If he wasn't before, he sure was now. That blush on her face gave it away. Issei now knew the ball was in his court. Sona may be good at chess and school work, but Issei knew he had talents. Of his own, one of which was playing dating sims. And the Sunere characters were some of his personal favorites. As Sona was waiting for some kind of response, Issei simply stared at her. This felt like an eternity for the devil heiress. Suddenly, Issei did something unexpected. Sona jerked suddenly once she found both of her hands in Issei's as he reached for them. He was also smiling very brightly which increased Sona's blush to that of a plum. Issei then replies in the softest and warmest tone he can muster. Sona, I would be more than happy to be your boyfriend. And, yeah, it sucks that you don't love me. But, if you don't mind, would it be alright if I love you? Issei then strategically removes his hands from Sona's and proceeds to look out of the train window while attempting to make a straight face. 
But if that's asking too much, then I guess. Issei feels as though he's scored at least 10,000 points as his lips are now attached to Sona's. Less than a second ago, Sona watched in horror as her hands left Issei's. To the further crushing of her little heart, Issei was no longer smiling and not even looking at her. Sona's instincts took over as she jumped from her side of the train car and into Issei's lap. Once there, the heiress used both of her hands to force Issei's face in her direction while going in for the kiss. As the two were embracing one another, Seraphal was watching with a smirk while recording the session on her phone. She was standing outside of the sliding door while pointing her phone through the window. Quietly and maniacally laughing to herself, the Mao had plans for this footage. Ooh boy, I am gonna mess with Sona on so many levels with this, wahahaha. Scene, the train car with Sona's peerage. As we see Saji, Momo, Ruruko, Rea, Tomo, Tsubasa and finally, Tsubaki, we notice that the squished peerage is very quiet. Nobody has said a word since the awkward moments involving Sona and Issei. What made matters even stranger was the fact that Seraphal left the car moments after the couple made their exit. After a few more minutes, Saji couldn't take it anymore. Okay, any of you mind telling me what the hell just happened? Things have gotten just straight up weird since Hyodo has been hanging with us. Especially with President and her sister, Saji was now looking from right to left with some perplexion written on his face. Tsubaki then clears her throat as she closes her eyes. Saji and the rest of you, leave it be. I am sure President Sona and Seraphal Sama will explain themselves to the rest of you, in time. Ruruko lifts an eyebrow while studying Tsubaki intensely. You know something, don't you? Tsubaki now opens her eyes, only to see each member of the peerage looking back at her with scrutiny and suspicion. The lightest sweat drop could be seen on the queen's forehead as she takes a deep breath. Adjusting her green glasses, Tsubaki stands from her seat. Now looking sternly at each member, Tsubaki speaks up in a low tone. Ruruko, Saji, the rest of you, once again, as I said, leave, it, alone. Chapter 15, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 15, Welcome to Kyoto. Scene, Sona and Issei's private train car. As the two continued their makeout session, a few bumps from the train on its tracks, caused the Citri heiress, who was still on Issei's lap, this caused Sona to rise a bit and then fall. This caused both parties involved to feel very aroused. As Issei's hands began to make their way towards Sona's breasts, the purple-eyed president pushed away from their kiss. She then took hold of both OS Issei's hands while gripping tightly. Issei now just stares back at Sona with a look of guilt. He then opens his mouth as Sona's expression turns rather serious. Oh, shit, Sona, I am so sorry, I was just really in the moment and all. I didn't mean to act like a scumbag just now. Please don't get mad. Issei's own expression turns somber as he looks incredibly distraught over what he thinks Sona is feeling. Though, he was completely wrong as Sona now began to blush once again. Seeing this, Issei mistakenly assumed that he went too far by calling Sona by her first name all of the sudden. Now, in a mental panic, the boy had thoughts of inadequacy and regret. Sona's growing blush was now accompanied by a very warm smile. You, you called me by my first name. Sona was feeling ecstatic only to see Issei not looking at her again and toward the window with a deep frown. Before she could ask, Issei spoke up, still looking through the window. I am so sorry. President Citri, I had no right to assume I could. Issei feels two hands on his face once again, pulling his gaze back toward a worried but happy-looking Sona. Looking very deeply into Issei's golden brown eyes, she spoke very softly. Issei, don't assume anything. Yes, you can call me Sona. After all, what kind of a girlfriend would I be if I forced honorifics on my boyfriend? Widening his eyes at the sudden shock of Sona's words, Issei was dumbstruck. So, Seraphal wasn't just trying to put my mind at ease when she said the Citris were different from other high-class devils. But, what about the Grimoires? I mean, could I ever call Rias by her first name? Wait, does that even matter now? She doesn't want me anymore, so what do I keep thinking about her? Issei got drawn out of his thoughts once he heard Sona clear her throat. Realizing that he has just been drifting off while deep in his own mind, 
the teen found himself looking at Sona's eyes, the color of purple, under those pink glasses. Issei begins to smile warmly, however his eyes begin to water up. Trying not to choke on his words, Issei has a question on his mind, one that has been bothering him for a while now. Sona, can I ask you a question? It's going to sound, well, maybe stupid, but I need to know. Now seeing the seriousness in the eyes of Hyodo, Sona nods while getting up from his lap and sitting beside him while still holding onto one of his hands. Issei takes a deep breath in and out. President Ramori threatened to trade me. Sona got shocked from the sudden statement but already knew about what was said so she simply nodded. So, are you and your sister planning on, I don't know, trading, me from Ria, President Ramori? Is this why you two have been, nice, to me? Issei now looked toward his feet. He was still smiling however tears were dripping from his cheeks. Sona then used her free hand to remove her glasses and took a deep breath of her own. To be honest, Issei, that never came up. But, I can tell you this much. If the subject of you being traded became a reality, just know that my sister and I would stop at nothing to, well, I don't want to say the word, acquire, as that would just sound. Sona was interrupted as her mouth was now being kissed by Issei. She could taste the saltiness of his tears and feel the sudden jerks within his body as he was joyfully crying from the inside of his soul. Without another second going by, Sona returned the kiss and moved her free hand toward the teen's head. She then ran her fingers through the teen's hair as they continued on in their act of affection. After another bump from the train, Sona breaks her kiss and proceeds to straighten herself out while placing her glasses back on. She then clears her throat again. Issei still had his eyes closed and his lips puckered out. This made Sona giggle a bit on the inside, however, she knew it was time to get serious as she knew the peerage needed a briefing on the mission to come. Hyodo, get up and wipe your mouth. It's time we get to business. We need to go back to the other car. Also, Issei, keep it, president, around the peerage, please. At least, for now, Sona now begins to blush again which collides with the attempt at her usually stoic behavior. With his eyes now open, Issei noticed the blush once again. He thought it was especially sexy when Sona attempted to hide her feelings, though he knew better than to tell her. Tsunere through and through, nodding, Issei stood from his seat while smiling. Don't you worry Sona, you can count on me, president. Sona nods at the statement while pulling Issei by his hand and out from the train car. Issei just as a delightful smirk plastered to his face as they walked their way back. Time skip, three and a half hours. As the peerage arrives at Kyoto train station, they are greeted by a pair of very beautiful women, both wearing red and white kimonos. As beautiful as they were, they looked out of place and out of time, from long ago. As Serifal, Sona and the peerage, along with Issei, stepped off of the train, they also looked out of place with their current and casual clothing. Sona was wearing a white spring gown which ended at her knees. It was a drawstring style as her shoulders were exposed showing off her pale skin. Tsubaki was wearing a black and yellow windbreaker style outfit. She looked to still have dark circles under her violet and amber colored eyes. She looked as if she wanted to tuck away in a corner and fall asleep. Serifal was wearing a black and gray business style outfit which ended in a short skirt with pantyhose and high heels. Standing between the three was Issei, wearing his borrowed clothing from Saji which was basically blue jeans and a blue and plain t-shirt. Serifal then ran forward and bowed toward the two women in kimonos. Kanichiwa, et your shi yo, watashi wa serifordezu, watashitachi o yusaka ni sertit kudasai. Bowing back, the two women use a hand gesture to point toward the train station exit. As the entire group follows, Issei can't help but wonder where they are going. The alleged mission briefing ended up to be nothing more than Serifal and Sona arguing while Saji and Issei played with a Nintendo Switch as the rest of the peerage watched them play Smash Bros. Now leaving the station exit, Issei thought to himself that this was the first time he'd visited the old capital of Japan. Aside from his fluttering thoughts involving the Sea Tree sisters, Issei was wondering what types of monsters he would have to fight for this mission. A large and stretch-style limousine was waiting for the party as the two kimono-wearing women opened the doors. Dozo o Harikudasai, Yokai no Shiro made a Tosukoshidezu. Once again, our protagonist finds himself sitting between Serifal and Sona. 
Both sisters had different expressions as Sona looked to be rather cross towards Seraphal while the Mao had a sunny and happy disposition. Inwardly laughing to himself, Issei couldn't get over what Sona told him earlier. He hasn't felt like this before and he didn't want this feeling to ever go away. Right now, the team felt like he could take on the world. As the limo began to park in a large courtyard, the peerage were delighted to see how beautiful this place was. Aside from the gorgeous yet ancient wood buildings along with walking decks that would go on throughout the entire property, the plant life was beyond stunning. Carefully manicured flowers, trees and grasses, all in perfect harmony with the multiple koi ponds that encircled the large castle, it was breathtaking to say the least. Then, the large twin doors opened to the entrance of the large and wooden castle. Walking through the entrance was an entourage of people wearing traditional Japanese attire along with ceramic fox masks. Behind these strange individuals was what looked to be a priestess of some kind. She wore a golden kimono with a black sash that had ornamental skulls adorned all over. Her hair was the brightest shade of blonde and looked to have the length of twice her body height. She had such hair put up into a golden and metallic headdress which had individual and long black picks with blue jewels on the ends. Her face, as solemn as it was looked to have the perfect complexion of cream color which ended in rosy cheeks. Her golden eyes were aimed toward her own sandaled feet. She was very sad about something, Issei could tell that much. Did she have something to do with his mission? Seraphal proceeded to bow toward the woman as her entourage stepped aside and made polite bows of their own. Now able to see this blonde woman's body as the large group of masked people got out of the way, Issei did the best he could to hold his reaction inward as much as possible. Okay, a few things were noticed, however the team focused on the first and most important aspect of this beautiful woman. Those boobs. She had the largest, most bountiful, most beautiful breasts Issei has ever laid his lecherous eyes on. They looked to each be larger than his head, Issei thought. Thoughts of motorboat heaven began to overrun the pubescent teen's mind, that was until his eyes wandered downward. Now tilting his head, Is began to internally count the amount of tails he was now seeing. There were nine, nine really fluffy and comfy looking gold tails. Deciding to now get a better look at this priestess's face, Issei noticed a pair of matching colored ears, animal ears. She can't be cosplaying as a fox. Right, Issei felt himself moving forward while now looking behind him. Puffing her cheeks out, Sona was pushing on his back. Come on, stop staring and move it. Once everyone gathered into the courtroom after the long walk down many corridors, which were all decorated in great detail with traditional Japanese artwork, Seraphal then pointed toward her sister and the peerage. Yasaka-chan, this is my sister, Sona and her friends. I brought them along to assist me in getting back little Kuno. So turn that frown upside down, we'll be back with your daughter before you know it. Seraphal then proceeds to make a Milky-chan signature pose. This created some great embarrassment for Sona. Issei on the other hand couldn't help how cute Seraphal was just now. She really was casual in almost all things. This made the teen feel even more at ease in his predicament. Yasaka looked toward Seraphal and stood from her seat. She then held out her arms as if she was waiting for something to happen. While in this position, the silent Yasaka began to show signs of breaking down at any moment. Of course she would, thought Issei she had her daughter taken. That much was known, there was nothing sadder than losing one's child. Seraphal then walked up toward Yusaka and proceeded to hug the woman. As this sad and hurt woman began to cry on Seraphal's shoulder, the Mao was patting the top of Yusaka's head lightly. There, there, Yusaka-chan, you just let it all out. Seeing how serious this was, Issei's perverted thoughts completely vanished as he wanted to kick the shit out of anyone that would hurt a child. Sona and Tsubaki noticed Issei's posture changing as his hands were now balled into fists. Noticing the stares, Issei turns his attention on his current, roommates. Speaking softly but with an edge to it, Issei shares his thoughts. President, Vice President, I am in serious need of some whoop ass. I can't stand pieces of garbage who mess with kids. When we find them, you can count on me 120%. Tightening, his fists even more. Issei said one last thing. Just give me 10 seconds, that's all I'll need. Sona and Tsubaki were stunned at Issei's declaration. He looked angry and determined. This was a side of Issei that the two never got to experience as of now. 
Issei now turns his gaze back at the sobbing Yasaka. Issei begins to grind his teeth while imagining how bad he is going to hurt these kidnappers. Just give me 10 seconds. Chapter 16, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 16, What Does the Fox Say? Scene, Streets of Kyoto. In one of the marketplace districts of the large city, Sona's peerage along with Seraphal and Issei were spotted, all walking in one large group. Tsubaki was leading the party along as she looked to be using the GPS on her phone. All was pretty quiet, aside from Seraphal cheerfully whistling one of the opening theme songs to her, Milky Spiral, series. Issei knew it was the fourth season intro, but was too focused on the task that was in front of him to comment. Sona noticed Issei's stare, as it was off into the distance. He didn't have the usual smile or even his normally relaxed features in which his face would naturally frown. No, this was anger. Though it was held in check, it was clearly anger. Sona got to learn a little more about Issei today. Aside from what happened on the train, she found out that Issei has a natural hatred for those that hurt children in any way. That in itself caused something to happen deep within Sona, something foreign to her. What the C-Tree heiress failed to identify was her own maternal instinct, creeping up on her little by little. So, as Issei continued to walk forward with both of his hands, still balled into fists while maintaining a hardly noticeable scowl, Sona would walk right next to him, while occasionally glancing toward his face. Whenever she did this, her expression conveyed a newfound sense of respect and admiration. Seraphal also had her thoughts involving Issei Hyodo and she found his words, although they were whispered to Sona and Tsubaki beyond heroic. But, at the same time, the Mao wasn't really surprised by Issei's reaction, in fact, she was counting on it. We should be close to Daidoku-ji Temple. It's supposed to be northwest of the main city. However, I am very surprised a rival Yukai faction would hide out in such a public location. Tsubaki put her phone down and looked toward the intersection between the next block. All right, there, we've arrived. Seen, Yasaka Castle, one hour earlier. All right kids, so, here's the mission. Yasaka-chan had her poor Kuno taken from her in the middle of the night. A ransom letter was left on the girl's pillow. It said that she is being held at some temple and she won't be released until their demands are met. Seraphal, who was standing in front of a blackboard began to scribble on it with a piece of chalk. She drew a quick box that was separated with a line through the middle. Inside the first side of the box, the Mao wrote, Ryoko Yuki Juro. After finishing, she then proceeded to write another name in the second side of the box which reads, Sakura Okuri Inu. Seraphal then turns around and looks at each member of the peerage with a sparkle to her blue eyes. Ryoko and Sakura are troublemakers. Hee <laughs> hee. Seraphal then moves toward the other side of the chalkboard while skipping like a child. Now scribbling once again, the words, Daidoku G Temple. Once finished, the Mao looked gingerly back at the peerage. From what I remember of Ryoko, she told me that the land in where Daidokuji was built, well, it used to be the home of her ancient ancestors. As far as Sakura was concerned, she always followed Ryoko around like a little lost puppy. Sona spoke up while, standing from her seat, Seraphal, are you telling me that you somehow are in connection with these criminal yukai? Tilting her head toward her sister, the Leviathan Mao's smile now turns into a frown. Satan, no, you don't call me. Seraphal was cut off the moment a very serious Issei stood up and spoke very softly. Seraphal, is Yasaka-san's daughter in any danger? If she is, we should get to this temple and take care of things, sooner than later. Seraphal, Sona, Tsubaki and the rest of the peerage now have their eyes on an Issei. This was a different person, not the usual happy-go-lucky one, not the sad one that was hurting, no, this was something else. Nobody said a word. That was until Saji stood up from between Momo and Ruruko. Saji then shows a confident smirk. Hyodo's right, we should find the kid. After that, we can chew some bubblegum, then claim we ran out, then open a huge can of lupus. Issei turned his attention to a grinning Saji. Looking blank at first, Issei then began to creep a small smirk of his own. Seeing this, Seraphal also has her smile return as Sona looks to be holding in one of her own. Scene, Daidoku G Temple, Front Gates, Present Time. Looking around the large and old Japanese relic, 
Sona then nods to herself. Tsubaki, help me to create a barrier. At her king's orders, the queen of the sea tree peerage assists Sona in creating a large and violet-colored barrier which overtakes what seems like miles of land. Once completed, both girls took a small but deep breath. Instantly everyone jumped the moment two women walked through the temple gates. They looked to have a third and much smaller individual who was being pulled along behind them by a long rope. Looking at both women, Issei thought they were pretty at first, but then he looked at what was behind them. Both of the kidnappers were wearing traditional kimonos and had completely different features. The one on the left looked like your fantasy snow maiden. She had white hair with silver blue eyes. Her kimono was pure white as pale clouds of frost followed her footsteps. The other one was wearing a jet black kimono along with a thick pair of beads around her neck. She had animal-like features, mainly pointed and black canine ears along with a matching and fluffy tail. Her hands brandished long claws while her mouth sported long and sharp teeth. So, the snow maiden must be Ryoko while the dog girl is Sakura. Meanwhile, the little girl that Issei had his direct attention on was tiny. She was blonde, like her mother, along with a pair of her own little fox ears. Wearing a red and white kimono, the girl was bound by her wrists with a rope that was being held by the one known as Sakura. Then Ryoko points behind Issei while showing off a nasty scowl. Seraphal, you bitch, so, whiny Yusaka came crying to you. Damn it, this is all your fault Sakura. The dog woman looks back at the snow maiden while scowling herself. PFF. I don't need to hear that coming from your apprehensive ass. We both agreed, taking the little fox shit from the Queen of Kyoto will get us lots and lots of cold hard cash. So don't you start making this my fault. Issei is grinding his teeth. Sona looks back at Tsubaki as the two nod at one another. Meanwhile, Seraphal throws both of her arms into the air while stretching. This gains the attention of everyone. After her loud yawn, Seraphal blinks a few times and spots a bench close by. Smiling, the mouse speaks up while rubbing her eyes. Boo, I'm tired, I am going to rest my eyes for a bit. Wake me if you need something. Seraphal then ignores all of the puzzled looks that she is receiving and proceeds to curl up onto the wooden bench and close her eyes. Sona's eyebrow twitches the moment she hears obviously fake snoring sounds. Coming from her big sister. Both Sakura and Ryoko look at each other and grin. They then slowly look back at their contenders while maintaining both of their evil smirks. Sona then relays a quiet order to Tsubaki. Let's do it. Instantly Sona throws a hand into the air and above her head. Tsubaki then jumps behind Sona while brandishing her mirror Alice sacred gear. To everyone's surprise, Sona now had a large ball of water, manifested above her head. It was easily the size of a double-decker bus. However, Instead of tossing this ball of water toward the enemies in front, Sona turns around and fires it, point blank toward Tsubaki. Once shot, Tsubaki holds her mirror toward the center of her chest as it instantly absorbs the attack. Then, Sona ducks down while smirking. Instantly Mirror Alice releases the blast of water at unbelievable speeds, directed toward the two enemies near the front gates of the temple. Issei's teeth grinding went to a sudden halt as he watched. As if it were slow motion, Sona and Tsubaki's attack make its way toward the two, still grinning, Yukai. Then, the snow maiden waved her arm in a casual manner. Before the large blast of water could impact the two kidnappers, it was somehow deflected back toward the peerage. Instantly, most of the peerage, aside from Sona, Tsubaki, Saji and Issei, were soaked to the brim as the magical water hit them with intensity. Not moments after, the soaked girls all began to freeze into place. Sona and Tsubaki both had their jaws go agape. Saji called for his sacred gear, Vitra and proceeded to shoot his drain line toward the dog girl. Smirking, the sea tree pawn's line wrapped itself around its target's arm. Realizing that there was something on her arm, Sakura looked toward the producer of this strange and black rope. Seeing a smirking teen boy, the dog Yukai proceeded to use her intense physical strength to simply yank on Saji's sacred gear. Now Saji found himself being pulled into the air. He was stopped suddenly once his face met with the Yukai's closed fist. Seeing this happen made Issei cringe for Saji as the teen was now passed out on the ground, next to the clawed feet of Sakura. Meanwhile the dog Yukai was unwinding Vitra's drain line from around her arm while grinning. Seeing his rival, 
laying on the ground while passed out, seeing most of the peerage, glued to the ground with ice, seeing a scared and crying little girl who just wanted to be with her mother, the teen couldn't take much more of this. President, Issei shouts at the top of his voice. Looking back at a determined and pissed off looking Issei, Sona nods back at him with a bit of nervousness. I need permission to be promoted. I don't want to waste any more time. All I will need is 10 seconds and this will all be nothing more than an inconvenient memory. Issei then looks in the distance at the cowering Kuno. Grinding his teeth he continued to speak with a much lower tone. I need to show these bitches that it's not okay to fuck with kids. Sona looks at Tsubaki and the two nod at each other. Now looking down at the ring she was given, Sona shows a slight yet worried smile. Okay, Hyodo, show us all what you can do. Permission granted. Without a second glance, Issei throws his arm up into the air. This gathers the attention of Ryoko and Sakura. Then, both of the Yukai girls' eyes widen in horror. Welsh Dragon over Booster, Balance Breaker, Scale Mail. Promotion Queen. After Issei declared these words, he was instantly enveloped in a very bright, overwhelming and very red glow. After a large pulse of energy, everyone that was within the vicinity, aside from a sleeping Seraphal, fell to their knees. All felt this overwhelming feeling of sheer exhaustion as the glowing burst of red continued to grow and grow. Sona was on one of her knees while gasping heavily. She then looked toward her queen who was doing the same exact thing. Subaki, R, are you alright? Sona then looked toward the rest of her peerage. Aside from the passed out Saji, near the feet of Sakura each and every frozen member was now free of their ice prisons. The problem however was that they all fell onto their knees or stomachs from the intense pressure that was clearly coming from Issei. To add to further concern, Sona's ring instantly bursted into red dust. Looking back now toward the red glow, Sona's eyes widened as much as they possibly could. As the red light diminished, an armored figure, tall and crimson, stood tall with all of its heavenly dragonic glory. The peerage, those who were still conscious looked in awe as Issei stood in a now, very aggressive looking stance. 10 seconds partner, it begins now. Hearing the words of something else coming from this red clad armored figure, both Yukai kidnappers began to worry greatly. As they were both on their knees, Sakura, the stronger of the two, struggled to get to her feet. Without a second's notice, Issei vanished from his position. Sakura, who was almost on both of her feet again, felt a sudden pain to her abdomen. Before she knew it, wind was flying against her face as she was now airborne. As she attempted to make sense of her predicament, a sudden and loud clunk brought her clarity instantaneously. Only Sona and Tsubaki were barely able to keep up with Issei's ungodly speeds. At first, it looked as though he rushed toward the dog Yukai and elbowed her directly in her stomach which sent her flying. She also no longer had hold of Kuno's rope. After that, Sakura ended up colliding with a very large and very old cherry blossom tree. One on the ground, she didn't seem to be moving. Before Sona and Tsubaki got the chance to turn their attention to the snow maiden, it was all too late. Dragon shot. All that could be seen was a red blast that impacted Ryoko with great force. As she screamed in agony, she also looked to now be airborne. Interestingly enough, the snow maiden made her way at incredible speeds toward the very same tree her partner in crime managed to collide with. Clunk. After another second, both girls woozily stood up. However, this was only for a split second as Issei appeared in between the two. To their sudden shock, both Yukai now that their heads butt against one another as Issei had both of his clawed hands on each of the Yukai necks. This clearly knocked both girls out as they hit the soft ground with loud thumps. Armored Issei just stands in his position, under the large cherry blossom tree. Petals began to fall from the tree and onto Issei's crimson armor. His helmet is looking down at both kidnappers. Then, his head turns toward a whimpering Kuno. She is on her knees with her hands still bound. Realizing he should have just enough time, Issei dashes toward the little fox girl while using one of his claws to release the girl. As Kuno looks up at her savior, Issei speaks up while feeling his energy drain very quickly. In Issei's balance breaker voice, the teen speaks up weakly. R, R, are you okay, kiddo? Don't worry, we'll get you back to your mom in no time. At Kuno's feet, Issei falls completely unconscious. As his body hits the ground, his armor shatters into magical bits of red dust. 
The drag then shouts out in a very proud voice. Reset. Now rest. Partner, you've earned it. Kunuo begins to cry even louder while reaching for Issei's body as he lays flat on his back with his eyes closed. No. What's wrong? Get up. Somebody. Help him. Finally able to move their bodies, the peerage all begin to stand up, including Saji, who now has a very black left eye. Sona and Tsubaki waste zero time running toward Issei's side. Both girls look at each other. Yawn. Oh good golly, that was a great nap. Oh, looks like Issei took care of this little mess. See, I told you sis, Issei's a good boy. Seraphal, who was now sitting up from the wooden bench began to stretch her arms once again. Sona goes livid. Seraphal, what's wrong with Issei? Well that's all for now see you in the next part.